The second component of rotation largely involves torque. To describe how torque works, we're going to throw down a quick uh, crescent wrench. Boom. And in order to loosen a lug nut or tighten a lug nut or whatever we happen to be working with with this piece of hardware, we'll apply a force over a given amount of distance to this object. We have thus produced a torque. Torque is equal to force times distance. And this is an oversimplification of torque problems. We didn't, for example, have to think about taking an applied force and converting it into only its vertical component or anything like that. The perpendicularly applied force brings about the torque. Clockwise rotations are given the convention of having a negative force. Counterclockwise rotations are given the convention of having a positive force. But let's apply these torque concepts to situations that you would actually see in a lab or perhaps an AP exam. Let's say we have a solid spinning disc or cylinder with string wrapped around it. And attached to the string, we'll pull it over a frictionless pulley system and apply a force of gravity to that system. Even though we're not working with the crescent wrench or something simple like that, we still have produced a torque in this situation. We have because when this object is dropped, its force of gravity will be completely transferred to the string, pulling on the perimeter of that disc. The radius of that disc will act as our distance value, and we can easily solve for the torque produced in this system. At this point, the force of gravity, which is also the force of tension on the string, multiplied by the radius of the disc. The distance from the perimeter of the disc to the innermost center point of the disc. Another quick example of the same phenomenon is when you wrap a string around a rotating T, such as a beam that's been adhered to a standing rod clamped onto a bench top. We have the string wrapped around the, the rod, and then we have it draped over, once again, a frictionless pulley. Once again, we'll have a force of gravity exerted straight downward that is then exerted perpendicularly as a force of tension to the outer perimeter of the rod. In order to accurately measure the torque of this object, you just need to find the diameter or perhaps the radius of the rod. And then it's the same phenomenon once again. Torque is equal to force of gravity times, in this case, radius of rod. I bring these two specific examples of, up here because these are the two most common versions of applied torque in a physics lab. Torque is most often used in these pretty fancy problems known as static equilibrium. It's just a fancier version of force free body diagrams. I'll show you static equilibrium problems with uh, a couple of quick examples. In one example, we'll have, let's say, a beam that's supported by two pylons. And let's say that we got a man standing on the beam here. There we go. At some distance from the first pylon, distance value d. Now it's important to note in static equilibrium uh, problems, nothing's moving. Everything's standing perfectly still. So if everything's standing still and there's no acceleration, then there's therefore no torque being brought about. In many static equilibrium problems or just torque problems in general, you can set your left-hand side of the equation equal to zero, saying that the net torque acting on the system is equal to zero. And then sum up the other torques that are acting on the system. If we choose an axis of rotation, and usually just in general convention dictates, we'll pick the left-handed side of our rotating axis as our, our rotating object as our axis of rotation. If you pick an axis of rotation, you can then pinpoint and figure out what objects are producing force in this particular free body diagram. In this case, we have three objects that are producing force. We have pylon number one. Let's get those pylons labeled. There we go. Pylon number one, pylon number two, and the man. Um, three things are producing force in the system, and let's go ahead and just write them all down. 
as far as objects that are producing force. I guess we should also figure out a distance of pylon number two from our axis of rotation. I'll call that d naught. Okay, so like I said before, we have three things on this particular scenario that are producing force on the system. You have pylon number one, and it's producing a force upward. Pylon number two, producing a force upward. And the man, producing a downward force of gravity downward. Okay, so those are our three objects that are producing force in this particular system. All forces are vertical, so we therefore don't have to deal with any horizontal force work. Okay, let's sum up those torques, because this equation that I was getting at over here was torque neck is equal to torque 1 plus torque 2 plus etc. However many things are producing torque in the system are applied in the static equilibrium equation. In this case, we have torque 1 produced by pylon number 1. Force produced by pylon number 1 will be a non-zero net force. It does push upward on the beam. However, because we picked this as our axis of rotation, its distance from the axis of rotation would be zero. Pylon number one therefore produces zero net torque. All right, and then we got the torque brought about by the man. All right, all right, his force is exerted, if we think about it, rotating this way. Okay, so that would be a clockwise torque. So let's make sure when we write down his force, I guess we can call it force of gravity exerted by the man. It's going to be a distance, and it's a negative force. All right, let's go with pylon number two. Thinking about a pylon number two produces a ah, counterclockwise torque, so that's going to be a positive number. And its distance. Cleaning this up, you're left with essentially the force exerted upward from pylon number two times its distance from the axis of rotation is equal to the force of gravity supplied by the man times his distance from the axis of rotation. Once you've solved for your forces, you can go back in and plug to make sure that all of your forces balance out. If we just treated the whole system as a free body diagram of a block, if you really think about what's going on here and forgetting about torque, you have pylon number two's force upward, pylon number one's force upward, and the man's force downward. All forces must be equal as this object is in you guessed it, static equilibrium, and experiences no acceleration or motion. Let's say we have a beam that's held up against a building with a rope, as shown below. Let's, our beam, let's say our beam has a length of 2 meters, let's say our beam has a mass of 5 kilograms, and let's say that this uh, line here is attached to the beam there. That point of attachment, let's call it 1.3 meters. Let's say that that's 1.3 meters from our axis of rotation. And just to help things out, let's say that our beam is being held up against a building. There it is. So this is zero meters. Okay, we're ready to go. All right, let's build a free body diagram for all forces acting on the system. First, we have the mass of the beam exerting a downward force of gravity midway down the distance of the beam. The beam itself has a mass of 5 kilograms, and it therefore exerts a torque on itself. Retreat it as a 5 kilogram object placed midway down the beam. Therefore, when we go to talk about the force of gravity caused by the beam, that produces a torque value. The torque provided by the force of gravity is equal to, in this case, thinking about it as going, okay, clockwise. Okay, so that means it's going to be a negative 50 times 1. That's the torque produced by the beam. There's only one other torque that's being produced in this particular scenario, and that's, of course, the string exerting a torque on the beam. But the force of tension on the string, if you noticed, is exerted at an angle. So you know where this is headed. Trig. 
we have to figure out what our x component of that force of tension is and what that y component of force of tension is. Realizing that that y component of that force of tension, FTY, FTX, that y component of force of tension vector can be lifted up off the page from here and placed right here to build us a reference triangle that we can use for the rest of the problem. Even though we can place that vector there, we still know when it comes to actually filling out the free body diagram. It goes here. Additional force values involve the building itself. The building will exert a force on the beam directly proportional to the force that the string pulls the beam into the building with. So I'll call that F building in the X direction. In addition, the building will exert a force on the beam vertically, but we don't know yet whether it'll be positive or negative. First, we have to sum up our net torques to figure out whether the force that the building exerts on the beam in the y direction is a positive or negative number. In order to figure that out, we'll use our static equilibrium problem. Since the beam isn't moving, we'll sum up our net torques to be equal to zero. Zero is equal to, all right, let's figure out our two torques. The force that the beam exerts on itself and the force that the string or rope is exerting in the y direction on the beam. We can now solve for and figure out with what force the rope pulls directly up, vertically up, on the beam. Force of tension in the y direction is equal to 38.5 newtons. Remember, we can place this vector over here to build this reference right triangle, with which we can now use to solve for our resultant force of tension and our force of tension in the x direction. Redrawing that reference right triangle over here, solve for both vectors. To solve for force of tension resultant, to solve for force of tension in the x direction. Our resultant force of tension, that is to say this vector here, 77 newtons. 67 newtons for the force of tension in the x direction. We're almost done. Things have gotten pretty hectic with this problem, and at this junction we don't really need to use the vocabulary of torque anymore, so I typically just draw the beam as a box at this point, and then let's sum up all of our forces that are acting on the system. Let's keep in mind what's going on. Force of gravity, force of tension in the y direction, resultant force of tension, force of tension in the x direction, the building's force in the x direction on the beam, and the building's y force directed on the beam, which we don't know yet if that's up or down. All right, after labeling our forces that are acting on the beam, we have to come to the conclusion of whether the building is exerting a downward or upward force in the beam. We can conclude that the building is exerting an upward force in the beam because our force of tension, 38.5, is a smaller number than our force of gravity, 50 newtons. Therefore, the building must exert an upward force at the beam. And there, there's all your forces labeled. Everything balances out. Force of tension we can kind of ignore at this point since that's been broken down into its x and y components. And everything balances out to yield a net force of zero.